Hello, everyone. I'm Alexander Zavalov, a student at Dartmouth College. Thank you all for coming tonight. Today, we're hosting a special speaker, Oleksiy Honcharenko, a member of Ukrainian parliament and vice president of the PACE delegation on mig uh, migration, refugees, and internally displaced persons. It's truly an honor to have you here, Mr. Honcharenko. Please join me in welcoming Oleksiy Honcharenko. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The event is organized by the Eastern European Student Club and Future Via Humanitarian Nonprofit. The event is co-funded by COSO, Dartmouth Department of Government, and the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth. So right now, Mr. Honchrenko, we will show your presentation. Thank Feel free you to very start. much. First of all, I'm very honored that uh, so many people came to listen. And thank you for interest to my country. Thank you for coming. And it is very important for me to explain and to address to American public and especially in universities and especially in so honored university as Dartmouth College uh, about what's going on in our country and why does it matter. But you know, I, I wanted to start from another thing, but uh, and you will you, you see the uh, name of uh, my presentation, Live Free or Die. By the way, as I know, New Hampshire knows these words very good. And, uh, uh, I think uh, that, that's really uh, what we will be speaking about now. But I think it is important, and we just met with one of your professors here in the Pine, and uh, he said that he thinks it's important to American people to understand a little bit how life in Ukraine today looks like. And uh, I decided that he's right, and uh, I want to start by not by the uh, presentation itself, but quite differently with one, several seconds, but you will understand it. Uh, but before I will do it, I just want you to remind, how uh, did you wake up this morning? Just for a second. How was it this morning? Maybe yesterday was a party, I don't know, maybe something else. It could be, but then the morning you woke up. And I want to show you how millions of Ukrainians woke up more than 300 days. I think uh, it's clear, it's an air raid signal uh, attack, and uh, every day for more than 300 days, millions of people, including two of my kids who are now in Odessa together with my wife, they are uh, waking up like this. And uh, I think that's important to remember and to understand that what's going there, it's not like Chamberlain said many years ago in 1930s, he said, you know, that's a quarrel in faraway country between people of whom we don't know anything. That's not. I believe this is a crucial moment in the history of the first half of 21st century because this is, and I want to ask you to go to the next, uh, our slide. This is the war of the free world against uh, dictatorship. And that's why this is so important, what's going on in Ukraine. And from the, th that will influence many things for, for years and decades ahead, and also things which are directly connected with the United States, and how do you live? And uh, you know, like Chamberlain, he said these words, and after this, London was uh, waking up with this sound for many years, because at, the, at some moment, uh, they just underestimated the, the danger. And it looks for me that sometimes, uh, this danger, which is now coming from a dictatorship against the free world, is also underestimated. It's not only about Russia and Ukraine. The picture is much wider. But it happened that now uh, the, the point, the crucial moment, the place in the world where it's happening and where the future for next decades will be decided is Ukraine. And I have good news for you, like it is said here. The free world is winning. That is very important because uh, like an introduction you heard, and maybe you remember the first days of Russian invasion, 
Many said that Ukraine would fail, that uh, it will take just days for Russians to take Ukraine, Kiev and uh, oh, the whole our country, but not. It happened absolutely other way. And uh, I want us to make a lessons from what had happened, and that's about we will speak uh, today. Please go next slide. So the question is, why in Ukraine? Why this has happened in Ukraine? And uh, this war between dictatorship and free world so, so awfully, so terribly is happening in our country. It's all about money and power, nothing new. Because Ukraine uh, is a very important country from many points of view. But for years it was like uh, Ukraine was overshadowed by, by, by Russia. And many people thought oh, that Ukraine is part of Russia. Oh, Ukraine is something between Poland and Russia. And what is this country? Many people just couldn't answer the question. Where on the map is Ukraine? But Ukraine is the largest agro-industrial country in the world. You should know that together Ukraine and the United States, we make from 30 to 60 percent of world agro export. Today the food is, uh, is a vital, absolutely, like yesterday and will be tomorrow. And Ukraine is a vital part of food security. The largest airplane in the world was built in Ukraine, not in the United States, with all respect, but in our country. Uh, technologies for production of supersonic plane engines, uh, the largest transit capacity in Europe. Uh, Ukraine controls, uh, controlling Ukraine, you control the Black Sea. And the Black Sea is vital. You can take it from history, that from the times of ancient Greeks, uh, Black Sea was the origin, it was a breadbasket of the civilized world. And now it's happening again. When Putin stopped uh, and, and closed the Black Sea by his threats, uh, and um, there was no Ukrainian maritime agricultural expert for, it was like five months, but it, this time was enough to increase the world food prices significantly. They raised like they picked, and millions of people in the world suffered from this. In some places, like in the United States, they just felt inflation. They just saw the prices in supermarket. But in some places, like in Somalia or Eritrea or other places, people were starving, and some of them starving to death because of the food prices peaking, because of closing of the Black Sea. That's how it's important. Uh, the most de developed IT industry in Europe, Ukraine is the source of uh, uh, IT specialists for the whole world, many of them working in our, at outsource for American companies, but it is essential. And the strongest army on the European continent. And I should add, also Ukraine is uh, almost 40 million people. And that is absolutely important uh, for uh, dictatorships. Because dictatorships, they have their own fuel. And the fuel of dictatorships are people. And that is something very, very unhuman. That is something very disturb disturbing. But that's how it works. I just want to give you a small part of uh, Russian Empire history. Russian Empire, the Russian Federation is still Russian Empire. It's just a new uh, Russian Empire. Then Soviet Union, it was Russian Empire 2-0. Now it's Russian Federation. It's Russian Empire 3-0. And uh, just, we will take the last 20 years. In 2000, Russia finally suppressed Chechnya, which is a small, tiny part of North Caucasus. To do it, that was a small nation, one million population, and Russia killed 200,000 of them to suppress them. 20%, one from five, were killed by Russians just to suppress this territory. But after they did it, now in 20 years, at that time, unborn Chechen boys now are fighting in Ukraine against Ukraine. Uh, then Russia in 2008, they occupied parts of Georgia, which is not a big country, also in North Caucasus region. And now they took parts of this uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And now boys from Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, young men like you, are fighting in Ukraine, are dying in Ukraine, are killing Ukrainians. In 2014, Russia occupied Crimea and part of Eastern Ukraine. And now they're taking people, young men like you, uh, to fight against their own compatriots. 
And that's why they needed Ukraine, because this is 40 million people and many men, which should, in their idea, which who, who should be taken to Russian army to attack Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, to finish with Georgia, and so on. That's how it works. That is the reality. That's why the name of this lecture is Live Free or Die. New Hampshire was very wise taking this as a motto. Because that is absolute re reality. If you are giving up your freedom, one day you will, take in, you will be taking your life. You or your children or your grandchildren. That's how it works. And that we should remember. Let's go ahead. So what is the lesson for the free world when we have such big threats? It's a really big threat what's going on. It's not only between Russia and Ukraine. It's in other parts of the planet. Many dictatorship, dictatorships, they're watching what's going on in Ukraine, what will be after, and then they will make their decisions to attack or not to attack, to move ahead or not to move ahead. And uh, the lessons of free world, I think there are three. It's dominating values, dominating the economy, and dominating the military potential. And that the third thing is also important. I know that, uh, you know, I was a um, uh, parliamentary PACE, which was said several times that I work in PACE. Uh, maybe you don't know what is it. It's Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which is situated in Strasbourg in France. And it was very interesting. I, uh, I came to France for our session. And there was a, a, a public event, not a public, like a rally, like a, on the streets. People coming to the streets were young people like you with the slogans, demilitarize France. That France should be denuclearized, demilitarized, and so on. It sounds very good, like, you know, if you don't want to have a war, don't have an army. The problem is that you can have no army, but Russia or other countries they have, and they will definitely use it, that you don't have army, and they have. So yes, with this idea, you will live very happily, but not long. Uh, so that's something we should remember. Military potential is essential. Let's go ahead. Values. They're clear. I will tell you nothing new. What are the values of the free world? Democracy and freedom, rule of law, human rights, market economy, that is uh, that, that are the values which, may, which really make free world the free world and which make life in free world like it is. Why the free world is prosperous? Why free world has such great opportunities? Because of these values. Let's go ahead. And these values, they are also very practical. It's not just words. I just want to show you the, the Russian army and Ukrainian army. It's a small picture. And that is not the worst picture of Russian army. Uh, so, military budget of Russian uh, army is uh, more than 60 billion of dollars. During the last 20 years, Putin spent to Russian army more than 1,000 billion dollars. 1,000 billion dollars. And now, in Russia, people are raising money to buy warm socks for their soldiers, which are mobilized and sent to Ukraine. Because they don't have it. Because majority of this money is just stolen. These money are in yachts of Russian oligarchs. These money are in palaces of Putin. These money are everywhere, I don't know, in some casino, in some mansions in the United States, in some mansions in Florida, in California, but not in Russian army, fortunately for us this time. But, but, that's, but that's how values work. Why it is important? Because only when you have democracy, when you have a rule of law, you can stop things like this. And Ukrainian army, with it, like, just for your understanding, in 20 years they said more than $1,000 billion. Ukrainian army, we spent on our army during the last 20 years near $50 billion, in 20 times less. But our army is more. Uh, is, is better equipped today than Russian army. Uh, let's go ahead. Economy. That is also very important, I think. We are saying the world is open and uh, let us, uh, free trade is important and that is important. But you know, when I'm sp I hear a lot about green energy and uh, 
and I, I personally, I want to see the world uh, being very environmental friendly. I want to see development of uh, green energy. Uh, that is really important, climate change and other things. Uh, but I think we forget one, one of the points, what is a clean energy. I believe that clean energy is energy from clean countries. I mean, clean countries with a clean uh, government, with the same values. Because when, the, when Europe, we have an example, when Europe became dependent from Russian gas and oil, the result today is quite difficult. Germany, France, uh, many other countries, they are suffering because they became so dependent from Russian energy sources, from Russian energy resources, from Russian fossil fuel, that today it's very difficult for them to survive. And uh, that is one of the lessons we should remember. You can't count on the resources from dictatorships because for them, everything is weaponry. They weaponizing everything. Food, they're weaponizing food. Fossil fuel, they're weaponizing energy. They're weaponizing everything. So in their head, they will use this against you sooner or later. Next, uh, we have the same experience in our country. There is country Belarus uh, to the north of Ukraine, and now it is occupied by Russia in reality. And we were dependent from Belarus uh, oil. And that is the lesson for all of us. I don't think that we did all right. I, I was one of those in Ukraine telling that we can't tolerate dictatorship. In Belarus, there was dictatorship, and it still it is, but now they are in, re in reality occupied. And I was telling for years in my country that we shouldn't count on this country, we shouldn't count on this dictatorship, we should fight with this. But I was said, oh no, this is a very good source for us to receive oil and oil products. And okay, this is dictatorship there, but really they, they don't intervene to our affairs, so let us be blind. And we were. And uh, when the war started, the same moment the flow of oil and oil products from Belarus was stopped. The same second. So you can't rely on this. One more is the United States of America and China. Their dependence you should, from factories, from production and manufacturing, it can't be like everything is produced there. Because one day, you will just not receive it. And that's why I think free world should be self-sufficient. And that's, uh, fortunately, it's a big, free world is big. And fortunately, and I believe in this, free world will expand. And I hope there will be a day when we will stay, maybe in some number of years, maybe here in Dartmouth, you will become, I saw these what beautiful books you have, 1978, you will have a book, 2026, and you will be in this book with your pictures. But you will come here and we will speak about free China, free Russia. That is possible. That is, I believe, the future of the world. But for the moment, it is not the case. And we should remember this. Uh, let's go ahead. Military potential. It is really important. And I just want to give you one example. And United States of America can be proud of its weaponry and of its military potential. We received from the United States I took two types of weaponry. High Marses, it's, uh, uh, and it's multiple launch rocket systems, and Javelins. Javelins is an uh, anti-tank uh, anti missile, um, man-handed. So they are both were developed in 1990s. And with this, we stopped Russian army. That was enough. Just imagine what we will do when we will finally receive planes uh, from the United States, at least F-16, because that is a powerful weaponry we need. One more question I was uh, asked uh, in American media if, uh, by American people. Why should we spend our money, American money, many money of American taxpayers to some faraway country? Why we should send to you these uh, billions of dollars? We have a lot of problems here, and we will have what to do. I just, that's why I, 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 I think that it is very important to answer this question. And I want to tell you that I really believe, and I have evidences of this, that investment in Ukrainian army is the best investment in the United States history, or probably one of the best. Because by spending 
of your military budget to Ukraine, we destroyed at least 50% of military capacity of your second biggest rival after China. 50%. And without losing no one American life, I think this is great investment. That is really great investment. And uh, uh, th that's why we need to continue and to finish this, because uh, uh, it's so important for everybody, for all of us. Also, um, one more number for you. Uh, there was a poll recently asking American people, what is the biggest problem in the United States? What should we care about? And 35% told that is American economy. And then a number of other things, and 3% said, again 3%, by the way, that it is a uh, war in Ukraine. But I want to explain to you why, uh, in reality, American economy is dependent from the war in Ukraine. Because if you will take... United States trade, even taking on the level of all states, including New Hampshire. Who is the biggest trade partner of uh, the United States of America? It's Europe. And even in all states, except I think of uh, Iowa, except of Iowa, all other 49 states, they are the number one trade partner is Europe. And what is the purpose of Putin and Russia? Is to disrupt Europe at all. He is not going to stop in Ukraine. He started Georgia, Moldova, and he wants to go ahead and ahead. It means if he wouldn't be stopped, millions of jobs of Americans, they will be under threat. Because uh, Europe, as the biggest partner, as the biggest market for the American economy, just will be finished. Let's go ahead. That is one example of uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, technologies, I can say. It's interesting that our country, in time of war, we are the first to make uh, the sea uh, drones um, which attacked and destroyed part of Russian fleet inside of their base. That's interesting. I think it shows the potential of our country and the uh, potential of free people. Let's move ahead. The main goal, I just want us to understand that these now we live in the world where free world coexists with uh, dictatorships. It will not be like this for very long. One of the forces will win. One of the forces will prevail. Because tyrants, they can't live normal life. They can't live like go democratic governments live. They, uh, they, they understand that they cannot, co they cannot coexist with free countries because that is a permanent threat to them. So they will attack, as Russia showed in case of Ukraine, or many other po possibilities are throughout the whole planet. And we should remember that, this, and we can't tolerate this. I made this uh, uh, parallel, like imagine cancer growing inside, not your, but somebody's body. Fortunately, this happens sometimes. And you can't live, uh, and, and, and one part of this body, I know, brain, can't say, I don't care about liver. It's impossible because everybody, everything is connected and uh, the, the whole body will die if the cancer will not be stopped. So the first step to live in free, defeat Russia together. That will be a signal for the whole world that free world is stronger. That is uh, also, that is a chance for millions of Russians themselves. Because just imagine this country, which is the most uh, the, the richest country in the world, from the point of view of sources. They have everything. Everything from uh, uh, chemistry, you can imagine they have, in the um, uh, ground. But they, for your understanding, near 10% of Russians today, in 21st century, they don't have a toilets in their houses. So they need to go outside. 10%. Just imagine this. The country is so rich, the country is so big, but, but, but they can't even give to their people the toilets. And they, were, and they were robbing, when their army invaded Ukraine, they were robbing everything, blenders, toilets. They were taking toilets from Ukrainian houses and flats to Russia. 
So it's absolute, uh, unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. So that's why the only way for Russians themselves to live normal life is to finally to become free country. Like who benefited more from the denazification after the Second World War than Germans themselves? Germany became one of the prosperous, wonderful countries respected in the world, but only after they came through denazification, when they stopped to be the cannon fodder for new crazy tyrant. This is a signal to China, because China is watching what will be in Taiwan. And Taiwan, you know, is a semiconductor and other things. Every, the, the whole world is connected changes the view of most dictatorship about the weakness of the free world. And you know what I'm speaking about. Because after Afghanistan, uh, Putin decided, oh, they're weak. We can go. Because he felt that it's possible. Shows an attractiveness of our model of development to other people, to other nations, because they will clearly understand this is, much, the, the, this is uh, the system which works. These are the values which work. And that will be a very strong signal. And definitely, uh, that is something to prevent the world war. Because uh, Putin is not going to stop. And those who are telling you, you know, uh, now there are a lot of discussions and about, oh, there should be some peace. Maybe Ukraine should give some of its territories to Russia. Okay, maybe. I just want to explain you. You can't, if you, uh, if you have in the community, Maniac, you can't say, okay, let's give one woman to, to him. And like, okay, it happens. No, because in one month, he will want the second, then the third, then the fourth. It's hunger in their head. They can't stop. And tyrants absolutely are the same. This is a geopolitical maniacs. And you can't stop them just by giving them something, no. To do this, we need, as I told you, to, it's important for us to win today. And we, before in this uh, presentation, when I was coming to you, there was also said tanks. Now we, finally, there is a decision of the U.S. government to give us tanks. Another story that we will receive them maybe in the end of the year. So it's not so good how it sounds, but still it is an important decision and we are very thankful for it. But still we are waiting for some other weaponry. It is most of all we need, it's aircraft, and long-range missiles. They're called Atacams. Uh, I just want to tell you also a little bit personal thing. And uh, the story about Ukrainian resilience is uh, really, it is really important. It's a big story and the whole world is uh, uh, surprised that we stopped Russia and we will defeat Russia together with free world. I am absolutely sure about this. But a part of this is, and why values matter, and what is the strength of free world? Strength of free world is our horizontal. Because Russia as a country, as a state, is vertical. There is empire, and there are all others somewhere down, and there is a chain. But we, United States of America, Ukraine, France, uh, Germany today, other countries, we are horizontal. Because we, we, uh, is this, we are the source of the power. And that's why today in Ukraine, everybody are doing everything they can for our victory. That's why you can't, vertical can't defeat horizontal. That is also a very important lesson. And one of uh, the examples that I have for this is the work of uh, Goncharenko centers. The network, this is the biggest non-governmental educational cultural network in Ukraine. Uh, we started before invasion, long before, as educational cultural centers, where children and adults were learning English language free of charge, we are learning uh, cybersecurity, financial literacy, and other things. After February 24, we also became uh, volunteer centers. And just this one, this is uh, the self-propelled Hovitzer which is called Gvozdika. Gvozdika, I don't know how to translate it uh, into... In, uh, it's a flower, yes, but uh, they, what exactly type of flower uh, it is. So, uh, because in Soviet army, uh, like uh, Americans, you call your tanks by names of your generals. Abrams was general, and so on and so on. 
In Russian, in Soviet time, it was time, uh, they called uh, the tanks, the hovitzers, by name of flowers. It's interesting, but uh, we have different types of flowers. They look like this, you should know. And uh, uh, by the way, it's interesting that Russians, they were saying their propaganda was telling. When Russian army will, will enter Ukraine, Ukrainians will meet us with their flowers in their hands. So this is the flower we are meeting them with. And this self-propelled hovitzer was bought by our centers. Once again, ordinary people like you, like your parents or neighbors, starting from small children, because they were coming for us with their one grivna, it's our national currency, 10 grivna, it's like a half dollar, to say we want to raise money for our army to stop our enemy. And with this, we bought this anti-drone rifles, many other things. That was done just by our network. And this is just a small, the, the, the very small part of the great volunteer work which Ukrainian people made. That's why the free world is stronger. Because everybody is fighting, not for some emperor, not for, but for him and herself. We know definitely what we are fighting for. We are fighting for our country, for our houses, for our children, because we want them to be free, because we want our country to be free, and we don't want to our, for our country, the future, as I told you, to be in a cannon fodder for next tyrant. That's why we are stronger. That's why we will definitely win. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Honchrenka, for your amazing lecture. We're now opening Q&A sessions. So we are welcoming questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Excellent question. Uh, first of all, it's very important just to spread. The, the, the main battle is always here. The main battle is for brains of people. And it's very important just to, to spread information, just to, to, in social media, to share, to like, to speak with your parents, to speak with your uh, friends, to tell them, you know, it's an important story. It matters for all of us. And uh, th that is the first thing. And I really, that is the most important. Secondly, definitely from this is coming the demand, we are in free country. And American politicians are doing what American people are waiting from them. If tomorrow American people will say, stop to send money overseas, that will happen. And that depends on you. To, to explain again, to explain people why it is important. To speak with politicians, to speak with congressmen, assemblymen, city councillors, to tell them why it is important. Uh, definitely, if you have an opportunity, you and your family, to donate, to help some humanitarian things, to help uh, our network or any other network in Ukraine, that's up to you, but that is very important because I, here is one lady, uh, hello, I want to introduce you, Lisa, right? Uh, Lisa, she raised in, just in New Hampshire more than $2 million for Ukraine. And there are people of like Lisa, a lot of in the, in the free world. That is again, the strength of free world. So if you can help by this, it's also very much appreciated. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, ways how you can make your input uh, in, in what's going on. And definitely I want to tell you that after our victory, Ukraine will be a great place to come, to work, to invest, to rebuild, because that will be like a polygon. That will be a place to show all the best which free world has today. It should become like, what will be better signal to the world if the country which was invaded by dictatorship, awful dictatorship, which was feared by the world, first will stop it, then defeat it, and then will rebuild and to show how free world is not only strong in military, but strong in their values and in their uh, uh, productive capacity. So you have a lot, I hope that somebody of you will come to Ukraine one day and will see our country by your own eyes. Thank you. Uh, 
changed or if it seeks war. Um, I was curious if you had some insight or what the current uh, position of the government is yeah. on that matter. Again, excellent question. So it's a lot of, it, it is discussed in the world and in different think tanks, in media, what is the victory and so on. But in reality, the question is simple. The victory of Ukraine is restoring of international law. It means restoring of our internationally accepted and recognized borders and by the Russia itself. Just, uh, I want you, some people are saying, oh, Russia, they felt that Ukraine should be part of it. It's not true in reality because Russia by themselves accepted our borders, signed all agreements with us about our borders. And they were telling, we are, the biggest, we are your biggest friend. They were telling it for years. But we were suspicious, but uh, it happened. Uh, and uh, so for me, it's clear uh, that it is not just victory of Ukraine. The victory of the free world should be restoring of international law. Just criminal, which is Russia today under Putin, should be stopped and punished. The borders should be restored. The Russia should pay reparations because our country is devastated. That is the victory. And, and dot, we don't want any piece of uh, Russian territory. Speaking about regime change in Russia, that is something which I believe is very important, but we will never fight for this. I don't think that we can and should go inside Russia, take Moscow, something like this. It's up to Russian people. We need to show that we are strong enough. We need to show how, what an awful thing was done by Russia, by Putin, and the people should understand this in Russia. And after this, they should change it themselves. That's what I think. And uh, we will not fight for regime change in Russia, but it is very possible that it will happen. Because if you will take history, Russia is the last colonial empire in Europe. It is the last. And uh, all colonial empires, when they are collapsing, when they are losing colonial wars, when they are losing imperialistic wars. And uh, that's what Russia is moving forward to. So after this, it is absolutely possible that there will be some revolutions in Russia. That, by the way, will be also not easy story because that will cause a lot of new challenges. Who will control mass destruction weaponry in Russia? What will go on in this huge territory? And so on. That can be a bloodshed there. Like 100 years ago, when the Russian Empire collapsed, there was a bloodshed for years on this territory. It's a not easy story. But, uh, but for us, it will be another story. Story of war of Russia against Ukraine should be finished very clearly. Russia just should be kicked off from Ukraine. Thank you. I just want to give a quick reminder before asking the question. Can a member of the audience please introduce themselves with their name and class here, if possible? Thank you. Again, excellent, excellent auditoria and excellent, uh, yeah, today you have excellent questions. So, uh, how it happened? I have two kids. One is 16 years old to another four years old. So, this one who is 16 years old, he should attend school. Um, and uh, definitely as a father, I am very concerned. He is not. <laughs> but, but I am very concerned because first two years of COVID, it's online education, and it feels for me that it's not so good like normal. Now one year of war, part of it, it was just online education. From September 1, part of schools restarted, but every time they hear this sound, they should stop and go to shelters. And uh, these sounds we have, un unfortunately, quite often. And it means that, it's not the best way. Uh, so definitely, I feel that my son and, and children, teenagers of his age or around, they really lost a lot of in their education. That's why I, I started this network of centers I told you. 
that was a, one of ideas how we can fill the gap which was which which happened because of covid now it's even worse so that is a very big challenge for us and uh, uh, definitely millions of ukrainian children now are in europe as the externally displaced people we don't like to call them refugees because also there are people here in in the united states we don't like to call them refugees because they want to come back home but for the moment, they can't because part of their cities are occupied or their houses are destroyed and their schools also. So they learn there. But uh, yes, that's something which is a challenge for us. We're trying to do our best to fill these gaps, but it's quite difficult. Yeah, please. Thank you. I'm a visiting professor from Ukraine for a year. Um, I have a question for the lecture. Uh, as a Ukrainian citizen, uh, I'm uh, truly interested in your opinion as uh, a parliament member. Uh, what do you think about the fight of corruption in Ukraine? Is it timely or untimely? Oh, it is the most timely. Uh, first of all, like I, I also need to say this, because I think it was President Trump who said that, oh, Ukraine is uh, the most corrupted country in the world and... Uh, it's not true, first of all. And it's not because I'm saying this in a member of parliament, but you can see it, it was one slide that I showed to you, that with the investments to Ukrainian army, much smaller than Russian, this is the scale of corruption. Do we have corruption in Ukraine? Yes. Is there corruption in the United States? Yes, also, you, there is, unfortunately. There is no place in the world without corruption at all. But the question is, is the country fighting with this corruption? Uh, or tolerating it. And the second question is, what is the scale of this corruption? So you can see by comparing Ukrainian army and, Ukra and Russian army, by Ukrainian uniform and Russian uniform, but by how Ukrainian soldiers are fed and Russian soldiers are fed, you, you can see the difference. R Russia is a very corrupted country. Ukraine is just a corrupted country. But we definitely need to do everything we can to make us less, less, and less corrupted from day to day. And we are doing it from 2014. We have these dynamics. So we are much better now than we were 10 years ago. That's why, it's one of the reasons why Putin attacked. Because it was clear for him that if he will not stop us now, in several years, there will be so big difference between Ukraine and Russia that even Russian people will start to ask questions. Why? What's going on? So that's why uh, we need to fight corruption. It is absolutely in time question. We are doing this. And for this, there is no better way to fight corruption than these values that we were spoken about. Free media is great immunity system. Uh, democracy, when people can change the government if they don't believe them, is the only way, and so on. So Ukraine is on the right track, and we will continue to do our best uh, and uh, corruption is a real evil which should be fought all the time. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. My name is uh, Josh Paul. I'm uh, 26 from Westport, Connecticut. Um, a few years ago, obviously, we had attacked the assault on our capital, but we almost lost our democracy. We just had very close elections with election deniers, almost won. And even we have people in, in our House of Representatives don't accept the results of elections or don't support the question we do. Our, the state of our democracy, I think, is still very fragile. What would your message be to the American in this critical two-year period going into the next election about what the meaning of democracy is, what we should do to fight for it, and what, our, what we should do as college students to promote these values that, we, that most Americans hold very dear to us? Thank you for your question. I will definitely will not give any my personal uh, thoughts, uh, because I, 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 being Ukrainian politician, I have no right to intervene into American poli politics. So uh, I will just tell you next that uh, you're absolutely right in what you said, that democracy is uh, nothing you just can inherit. Democracy exists because each new generation believes in it and if needed, fights for it. The moment uh, the next generation will say, we don't care, this exactly moment there will be people like Putin who will say, finally, I'm here. 
I will be your eternal president. You don't need anybody but me. And you don't need to care about anything. Don't think about anything. I am your God. I am your leader. I am your Messiah. And uh, that's why just be very attentive to these signals. Just remember this. And never, and also remember that the process of losing of democracy is not just the one morning you are waking up and there is no democracy. Yesterday it was, today not. It's not like this, it's a process. And if you feel that media are influenced, that they are not really free, that uh, the government doesn't want to change, and if, if something after results of election or anything else, that is a signal that you should react. Fortunately, there are no, I don't think there are so big threats in the United States that you need, like in Ukraine, we were on the streets several times making revolutions. Fortunately, you don't need this. You just need to go to vote and to be active citizen. I think that is absolutely enough to secure your democracy because you have healthy system, but it will be healthy as long as you will fight for it. Thank you. The question I have to you, you have mentioned that you have volunteer centers that are helping yeah. train in the municipal cities. So the question I have, with everything going on and the heavy load that volunteers are carrying in Ukraine, uh, what are their concerns right now? Because one can only add much in 24 hours. People probably are having work, side job, family, everything, and on top of everything else. They're helping communities, they're helping others, they're trying to make the country better and trying to fight for the victory. So what can, what the volunteers need right now? Like what do the volunteers themselves need? The people who carry this load of doing good. Uh, yeah, first of all, I could start with money, but I will not. Because the most important thing for us is to have hope. That is something which, 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 uh, which is the engine of volunteers, of people. We need to know that there is a light in the end of the tunnel. And we know this for sure in Ukraine. That's why we are moved, doing everything we can to make it closer. Why I'm here today? My family is in Odessa, like in the thousands and thousands of miles from here. And uh, every time I have this application with air signals, and I hear it, you understand what I think and how I feel. But I think it's so important to be in the United States because United States is the leader of the free world. The most powerful country from all points of view in the free world and in general because of these values that we spoke about. And for us, the support from the United States is vital. So uh, what we need, we need to know that the first thing the Ukrainian volunteers Ukrainian civil society needs it is to know that we are backed by the free world, that free world is behind us and is supporting us. And the United States is country number one in this. Secondly, definitely we need resources because you can't do anything without anything. So you need, uh, people are coming to our centers to make masking nets, camouflage for, for our army. And uh, they are doing it certainly free of charge. They just want to do something to make their input. But people, other people are taking their old clothes, which is cut in pieces to make this camouflage. But in any way, we need the basis. It's a kind of tissue that we need to buy. Without it, you can't make this masking net. So these bases we need. And uh, uh, probably this, and really everybody can in our, for example, centers, there are a lot of, uh, once again, that's not something unique. In Ukraine, there are a lot of such centers, there are a lot of such initiatives. But for example, in our center, one of our uh, contributors uh, is uh, Lord Ashcroft, member of House of Lords of the United Kingdom, for example, and so on. So it is important to know, and it's also important morally that he's with us, but also financially. So that's what we need. Please. Yeah, please. My name is Grand Jao Sheikh. I'm 26. One thing you said that really resonated with me 
Everybody at 26. There was some kind of, there was some kind of uh, a requirement to come here to be 26. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, great question. That's something which are debating in the country. And I, am, I believe that what is the future of Ukraine? I believe that after what we came through and coming through now, uh, we can't be the, like, the same country we were before. We can't just kick off Russians and say, okay, we can be a yeah, better country, less corrupted. But, but no, I think uh, the role of Ukraine for decades ahead will be the, to be one of the strongholds of the free world, one of the uh, frontline units of free world. We will have very strong army. Why our army is so strong? I think today it's the second strongest army in the free world after the United States because of the battle experience that hundreds of thousands of our people have today, unfortunately. Unfortunately, but they have. And that makes our army so strong. And uh, that's why I, I am one of those who are saying in the country, we should be the key ally of the United States and free world in the region. And we can't, there, there was uh, something which I was disappointed by in the decision of our government. There was a voting in the United Nations about uh, possible genocide of Uyghurs and Ukraine abstained. Uh, in the United Nations. And they will say, you know, it's China, it's a very big country, it's still there, a little bit like neutral, maybe a more positive to Russia, but not very much. We should be patient and so on. And I was telling this is a mistake. We can't address to people saying, please recognize genocide of Ukrainians, and there is genocide. Russians are making genocide. That is not, I'm not telling you my political uh, some estimations. That is a fact, because if you will take United Nations Charter on prevention of genocide, there are five criteria. If even one criteria is met, it's already genocide. It is a public, uh, public announcement that this group does not exist. This group, religious group, an ethnic group, any group. And that's what Putin says. He is saying, Ukrainians, they don't exist. There are Russians, and they are bad Russians. There are no Ukrainians. Russia is saying, what we need to do? We need to de-Ukrainize Ukraine. This is a clear genocide. Second thing is forceful deportation of people. And we have it, especially children. They are taking our children from orphanages and even with parents and sending them to Russia and, and, and giving them to some families throughout the whole country from Far East, from Siberia, even there, just to make from Ukrainians Russians. That's what they want. And that is a one more you know, criteria of what is genocide. A lot of sexual crimes, rapings. That is exactly criteria of what is genocide. And certainly mass murders. Unfortunately, also we have this. So this is a genocide. But we can't say, the world, you should stop the genocide of Ukrainians. And at the same time, genocide of Uyghurs. Where are they? Oh, it's so far away from us. We, so we can't, we can't do it like this. We should be, absolutely, we should be the best defenders of these values in the world. That I believe, and uh, many people in Ukraine think so, and I'm sure that Ukraine will be, like the, the most, like because for us it is very painful. We came through this. We will understand, we understand better people in such circumstances than people in some normal countries with a normal life. That's why we should be very, very attentive to this and protect everybody we can. Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Kyle. I'm a, I'm a 22, so I guess I'm a little bit Wow. Um, my question for you is, do you hope that after the war, uh, maybe hopefully after Ukraine retakes, the Donbass retakes Crimea, 
that Ukraine will then go on to join the European Union, will go on to join NATO. Absolutely. Are these both organizations that you hope Yeah, that is definitely our way. We already became candidate to European Union. And uh, uh, I believe uh, that, and today just NATO, I was in the NATO summit in Madrid uh, this June, last June. You know, and I want to tell you that was historical. It was really how the free world was united. And that was very inspiring. Because for the first time in history, uh, Prime Minister of Japan came to NATO summit. Australia, South Korea, other countries, and definitely Korea. I think that that should be this process of expanding a free world. On, it started after this war. And that is so important. So definitely Ukraine should become member of European Union and NATO. And also our neighbors, Georgia, Moldova, other countries which are still not, they should also become members. We should unite. You can't just stay. You, either you will expand or you will shrink. That's about free world. So we should expand free world, not only about Ukraine, but about other countries too. Yeah, please. My name is Maria, I'm 25. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Um, touching on the topic of human rights, um, I know that in your intro video you mentioned um, the potential of a Nuremberg-type uh, kind of war crimes tribunal. I wanted to ask you kind of what that looks like right now in Ukraine. Are there ongoing preparations um, or serious documentation processes for things like sexual violence or other war crimes? Um, and yeah, is the government already kind of preparing for something like that to happen after war? Yeah, definitely. That it is. Uh, first of all, for us, it's justice. Justice to people after everything they came through. Secondly, and that is already important for everything in this room, is to prevent such things to happen. Because the only thing to prevent new crime to happen is to prosecute the crime which already happened. So that is the same in the international law, and we should do this. And I, as you maybe remember in my, this introduction video, I said, and after New Nuremberg, there should be tribunal against Russian war crime, uh, war crime uh, people who did it, uh, including Putin himself. That is very important. And uh, we are collecting evidences. We are doing a lot of job in this direction. I just came here from uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where uh, we made a resolution on an international tribunal. And uh, we want to establish it as quickly as possible. Just special, first of all, special tribunal about the main, the mother of all war crimes, war, uh, crime of aggression which should be leadership of Russia should be, and Belarus should be punished for this. But definitely we are also, there are already convicted people in Ukraine, Russian uh, soldiers and officers who killed, who raped, and we will continue to do this. And I think it's something which you remember, you know from history, that some Nazi uh, criminals were found when you were already alive, when you already lived. I mean, just 20 years ago, for example, in some Argentina, in the people in their 90s, some German Nazi criminals, they were found and prosecuted. I think that's the only way. Because it every, let it better quicker. But if we, it will take decades, we need to finish this job. We need to find everybody. And that will make the world better. Please. Yeah, it's like two questions. First, I'm not a military expert. This thing, uh, you definitely, you can't estimate exactly. I, I needed to have some number, like 3% of budget, which is clear. You can just divide. And 50%, definitely, it's not an exact number. But uh, uh, military experts are saying that, taking into consideration that Black Sea Russian fleet is almost destroyed, taking into consideration thousands of Russian tanks, 
armored vehicles and other um, stuff which is destroyed, we can roughly estimate that this is near half of a Russian conventional war, that is important because also there is a nuclear weaponry, but conventional war potential. So definitely it's roughly and it's more expert at, uh, estimation, but I think it's quite close. But you're, the second question, you're absolutely right. As I told you, for, for dictators, people is a fuel of their dictatorships. And that's what we see in Russia now today. They are really, they, he is conscripting people all the time. They hadn't stopped mobilization. It's on the way in Russia. And uh, he, by this, Putin thinks that he can, even in such bad circumstances, even after his for initial plans failed, even after uh, all this level of corruption, which I think even him, he, he couldn't imagine, uh, and so on. But even after all of this, he still believes that he can achieve some of his goals. By what? By these people. By, by sending hundreds of thousands of people to die, but to, to, to keep the position. Uh, so this is, a, and this is the threat. That is the threat, because this war has not finished. That's something which I am telling to my colleagues. And that is so frustrating because these decisions about weaponry supply to Ukraine were so, so slow. And all that I'm so protracted that this gave possibility for Putin to come to this war of attrition. Why I can tell you this too. When the war started, I joined territorial defense to defend Kiev. I was in Kiev. Uh, I never had military experience, and I hope that I will never have again. But there was no, I couldn't run away from Kiev uh, as MP, but there was also not much place for me as a parliamentarian to do when Russian army was 30 kilometers from my building of the parliament. And that's why for the first month I was in territorial defense. Uh, so I, I took Kalashnikov in my hands. In one month, when Russians were kicked off from Kiev, uh, I finally could t take back my selfie stick because I'm much better with my selfie stick than with my Kalashnikov and do what I really can do. Uh, but I, being in, in territorial defense, I can tell you that if Ukrainian army would have in March of last year weaponry that we received in May, June, high marses, howitzers, and other things, we would finish everything in April. When Russians were retreating, but we didn't have with what to purchase them. And that gave Putin possibility to refresh a little, replenish, change plans, to mobilize, to send this new, new, new cannon fodder to the front line. And that was a big mistake. And all the time, unfortunately, it looks like the free world is like chasing after Putin. Putin is sending more people, okay, we will give you more officers. More people, okay, we're giving you tanks. It's very frustrating about patriots because like it was clear from the first, from, from summer that Putin will weaponize winter, that he will attack power grid, that he will destroy this in order to make people suffer and that we, that we needed at that time uh, air defense. But still our allies made this decision only in January. And it means that we will receive patriots maybe in April, maybe we, we, we still don't have them. And that's why uh, Russia is still quite successful in their attacks against our infrastructure. So that's the problem. Everything could be finished quicker, and that would be in benefit of the whole world. But still, it takes a lot of time. So, yeah. Please. Hi, I'm Eric, I'm a 23. Um, I was thinking many of our international organizations were created to prevent wars of yeah. territorial conquest and genocide. And in spite of that, we've had multiple genocides and now we have a war of conquest. Do you think at the end of this war, we should build upon our existing international system of like the UN and such, or should we form new systems? Absolutely, that new or modernize these, definitely. First of all, Russia should be kicked off from Security Council. And by the way, those from you who study politics or law, I can tell you that uh, you, it's very easy uh, quest for you, very easy uh, like uh, thing to, 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 to make in your decision because 
uh, Russia, if you will take charter of United Nations, you will not find Russia there. If you will take who are the members of Security Council, permanent members of Security Council, you will not find Russia. And well, even more, Russian Federation never entered United Nations. Ukraine entered, Belarus entered, many other countries, yes, Russia never. So what they're doing in Security Council, it's a very interesting question. So definitely, Daddy, we have very big gaps in this international law, in all these systems, in international security systems, and we will definitely need a very big reforming, very big reforming. But good thing I will tell you, 100 years ago, many nations didn't care about genocide at all. Now, we have, yes, unfortunately, we still have these things, and especially, unfortunately, for me in my own country. But it's much less than it was. So we're on the right track. We need to establish, to continue, to, 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 to defend international law. And step by step, we will build a real world in which like, the, pe the person, the human being, will be the biggest value. So we're coming closer to the end. Um, I don't know if someone wants to ask the last question, but after this, uh, we will have like about like half an hour uh, for those people who want to stay and uh, get to know Mr. Hontrenka on a more personal level. And then we still have some cookies. You're welcome to take. But um, if anyone wants to ask uh, the last question, or if not, I have a question I would ask. Um, okay. I'm Karevo, I'm 26. Uh, I want to ask you a question about the Ukrainian parliament. Because right now Ukraine is under martial law. It requires a lot of executive decision from the president, from the army. And it may seem that the discourse is a bit downplayed right now. So what's the role of the parliament today? Uh, I can tell you that uh, it's... Uh, you know, Russia was for years saying that you, in Russian propaganda that Ukraine is failed state. At this stage, in reality, they don't exist there. But it happened that it is Russia failed empire. Because Ukraine showed that our institutes are alive. Our parliament was gathering in the building of the parliament when Russians were 30 kilometers from our building. It's very close. It's a artillery shelling distance and uh, not even missiles or something like this. And uh, uh, we are a country with the rule of law. Um, all what ha what's happening in Ukraine is according to our constitution. We are changing the laws. Yes, definitely our juridical system was not prepared for such a full-scale war. So now we need to make a lot of to changes in the law. We need to think about people who are externally displaced. Now, for example, the last thing we made, that people, Ukrainians, can marry outside of Ukraine. Like, for example, that's a question. Before it was not a question for us, because like, now we have this question, because millions of people are outside. So we are doing our job, parliament is working, laws are uh, adopted in the right way. Uh, I want even more, I think that parliament can play a bigger role and can more oversee what's going on, more doing the, our job in fighting corruption and other things. But I should be, I, I can be proud of Ukrainian parliament. It works and uh, yeah, there were also MPs who ran away from the country. There were several who betrayed the country and they started to work for Russia. Unfortunately, these were people like this too. But they, uh, that was a tiny, tiny number comparing to the parliament which united in order to defend the country. So I think that's important and very good question. Thank you, Kirill. Thank you so much for these amazing questions. I wanted to ask one question. So um, Mr. Honchenko has this really heroic story of hoisting a Ukrainian flag on the highest point of Crimea, Mount Ipetri. Yeah. So can you share what you were feeling and can you share a little bit more about that story? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, as I told you, in 2014, Russia occupied part of Ukraine, which is Crimea. Uh, and. Uh, at that time, I was president of Odessa Regional Council. It's like uh, president of uh, New Hampshire Senate, something like this. And uh, uh, on August 23, which is a national flag of Ukraine day, yeah, um, the, my, my job was to raise our flag near our, the building of Odessa Regional Council. 
But I thought that it was more important to go to Crimea. And that, at that time, it was still possible. So I entered Crimea. I came to the, one of the most famous places in Crimea, which is Mount Sinai Petri, a very beautiful place. When you will come to Ukraine, uh, you should uh, welcome to Odessa and to Crimea uh, separately. But that's very beautiful. And I raised the Ukrainian flag there. Uh, saying uh, that uh, this is Ukraine. And uh, that was a very mixed feeling because uh, I, from one point, I, it was a feeling that I'm in Crimea, which is Ukraine, and now it is stolen from Ukraine. And that was painful. But on another hand, it was a great proud that they can steal it for some time, but in the end of the day, ours will be ours. So that was how it was, and uh, that was important for me to do this. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much.